I have Elizabeth Stewart today. I'm going to tell you about something I got up to yesterday. And I don't know if I did the right thing or not, but we'll, we'll find out. Oh, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about copper cookware. And I have this antique um, copper pot that I've had for years. You can see, I'll describe it a little bit. It has copper bale handles, which I point out they're copper because a lot of times copper pots will have um, iron handles. So these are copper bale handles. It has a really distinctive shape. You can see that the bottom is rounded. And you can also see that it, this is what we call do dovetailing. And so the, the piece is made by dovetailing this very central bottom piece into the, into the pot itself. And you might ask, why is it shaped this way? There's two reasons. Number one is it's, it's shaped to taper in because it holds the heat better. But the round bottom means that it can go in the fire directly, or it can also sit on a stand. So the stand that it would have sat on would be about so round, and it would have had legs, and it could stand over the heat. And of course, the round bottom means it could, it could fit anywhere on that stand. So it's pretty ingenious. I think this is 19th century piece. And what you want to look for in copper, antique copper, is you want to look for hand riveting. And you can kind of see, I don't know if you can see here, the, the handles are riveted into the, into the piece itself. Hold it there for one second and let me see if I can show them. So it's, okay. And then they're, they're riveted, you can see the rivets here. They're riveted in two places because the strength of the pot, you want, you want that to, to be very strong. So it's riveted in four places and it's all the way through to the pot itself. Now, while I was working on this thing yesterday, I, uh, I noticed that some of the dovetailing had shown little tiny holes in the dovetailing. And why that actually wouldn't have been the case when it was made was originally you can kind of see remnants of it. when it was originally made it was lined with tin and tin is a very traditional liner for copper um, the other alternative in modern times is stainless but the idea of tin and copper together goes back about 10,000 years because copper and tin naturally bond together there's no man-made chemical that binds them. They actually bind together in, in a seamless way. And so tin was the first invention to line the copper pot with because it conducts heat the same rate as copper and it fuses so easily with copper. And as opposed to stainless, um, like for example, if you shop Williams-Sonoma, you'll see stainless lining in copper. Stainless is uh, stickier with food but also stainless does not fuse naturally with copper, so it has to be mechanically, chemically fused. What that means is if you cook with it, it can develop a, um, a, a fissure between the copper and the stainless, and if you leave it on the heat by mistake, that pot will explode because it's not necessarily joinable. So that's why the ancient people used tin lining on copper, and this is a very ancient form you can see the lip. At one point, there would have been a cover to this. Is the lip is raised, and you would see that there was a room and space and a platform for a cover. And I imagine the cover was probably slightly domed and also riveted. Now, how I discovered this is of Middle Eastern origin is because this shape with the kind of a circle that ends in a really straight line and then forms another curve. This is a very traditional Middle Eastern shape. So when I got it out of storage, yes, I do have a storage locker. When I got it out of storage, it was completely black. In some places where it wasn't black, it was covered with a green verdigris. And you can kind of see that, um, the, the blackness that remains under the lip and also on the rib riveting here. So this blackness is caused when the verdigree reacts with the air, and the blackness is a, a real problem. Um, so I figured, OK, let me just clean this pot up, because it's a pretty pot. And I thought, well, it would look really nice with old blankets you know, rolled and stacked in it. So what I did was I figured, all right, 
Let me get the um, let me get the drill going, and I have this little tiny piece at the end, and it's got a like little um, plastic or rubber, I don't know, kind of a brush to it. So I did that, got on goggles and gloves and a mask, etc., and trusty old barkeep was spread. Now, I worked on this thing for a couple of hours, <laughs> and I don't know if I did right or wrong, and at the end of it, I um, coated it all with beeswax, and then I buffed the beeswax. Now, if this was a very valuable piece, I would be sitting here full of regret <laughs> talking to you about my process. Um, and, but, you know, what are the other alternatives? What can you do if you collect old copper and you love the glow of old copper? What can you do um, that will help this blackness that over time it's naturally occurring? Well, the answer is you use some kind of acid. And the acid that um, I think I would recommend, and I might even try it, would be a lemon juice mixed with salt. You scrub with that, and that is supposed to help. I don't know in this case if it would have helped that much because, I, I mean, I've owned this piece for 20 years, and the, I inherited it from somebody who owned it for probably 60 years before me. So it had probably, you know, 80 years of blackness on this thing. But you can see, as much as I could get the black off the piece, you know, I can't get it completely off. Why? Because the piece is hand hammered. What do we mean when we say hand hammered? So when you are shaping a piece of, of copper, what you're doing is you have a, more or less a flat sheet of copper. To get the shape, to get the round shape, and to get the, you know, uh, incremental shape, what you're doing is you're hammering that sheet of copper. And so all these little dead marks are the work of some unknown craftsman hammering the piece into the shape that he wants. So the shape would have been made in a number of parts. So if you see, for example, um, right here, you'll see a faint line. Uh, that's, that's where the pot sides join with the bottom that's going to actually be curved. And so there was a fissure here that was actually heated and joined together in its original conception. So the piece would have been made one piece here, round, you know, you'd hammer a long round, a long sheet into a round shape, and then that would have been adjoined with the bottom. There would have been a hole at the bottom um, because, of course, you think about it that it's, it's a, a long rectangle of copper and so there's a hole at the bottom when you actually wrap that and this is where the dovetailing occurs. Almost all copper pots are made that way, that are hand hammered. So if they're naturally machine made today and they're modern, they're not going to be made that way. The copper is going to be poured into a mold. But the old way of making copper pots was to hand hammer them. And you can really see all the hand hammering. So um, a little bit about copper. Um, so copper is naturally occurring. And so it was fairly easy on, you know, 10,000 years ago for people to start working with copper. And copper is actually fantastic for cooking because it actually spreads heat evenly and it cools down really, really fast. So copper is used to sear things. It's used for sauces because you need copper to reach a certain specific consistency in sauces. The only problem with copper is that it, it reacts, like we said, we could try cleaning this with acid. It reacts badly with acid. It's not a natural friend to acid. So anything that you cook with acid, uh, such as wines or lemon juice in, in a recipe, it's not going to work. The exception to the rule is jellies. So for many, many years, Americans have made jellies. As a matter of fact, we have a long tradition of copper. And I found it interesting to note that Paul Revere was a coppersmith. So we have a long tradition of American copper, a long tradition of jelly making. And jelly making is traditionally made in a copper pot. As far as the object classes are concerned, 
collectors love jelly pots. And what does a jelly pot look like? Well, it's straighter side, it's a bigger pot, it's a flat bottom, and there's usually two iron handles on either side. And it's an open, it's an open pot. But early American jelly pots are, are extremely valuable and desirable. When you have a jelly pot that's unlined, in other words, the copper itself is conducting, it doesn't really matter that you have any acid in that jelly that you're making because the fruit will absorb that in a, in a way. And you don't need to have it lined. You don't need to have a jelly pot that's lined. So the really good antique copper jelly pots are unlined and pure copper. The downside of copper cookware, as antiques are concerned, is the, is the upkeep. You've got to polish. What you want to do is you want to try to avoid that green glow because the green glow will turn into that blackness eventually that really kills the piece. It's really hard to get off. Like I said, you know, the only way I could think about doing it was you know, this way. So I think that if you um, have a problem with copper, the main problem is going to be that copper needs to be cared for and it also needs to be relied occasionally. So what do I mean by that? Well, the best French restaurants that swear by copper because there wouldn't be French sauces without copper. They send their pots out regularly to be relined in tin. And that tin relining is important because tin breaks down at 450 degrees. And of course, most people cook with the higher temperatures than that. So over time, that will, the, the lining will be worn down, the need to be relined. Now you might be thinking, well, what's the value of such a thing? Um, the value of this pot, because of its size, it's 18 inches in, di in diameter. This is a big pot, and it would have been used in the 19th century in the Middle East to make any kind of stews or any kind of slow cooking, whatever, on that stand in a fire. Um, and so the value of this is, is, I would say, around 500 because it's in such good shape. Um, all of the riveting is perfect. Like I say, the only problem is, did I do any damage by actually taking a drill and barkeeper's friend <laughs> to the piece? I don't know. The finish is still okay. The way to um, uh, remedy that is sometimes to varnish the pieces. This is wrong, wrong, wrong. You don't want to varnish copper pieces. You want to just, if you've got copper and you've got any kind of other metal that needs to be polished, you know, maybe devote an hour. It's kind of meditative and, re and relaxing to, to polish anyway for me. So devote some time so that they don't get to the point where the patination and the verdigris or the corrosion is now turning into that black, that blackness that will that, absolutely kill copper. So I hope it's helpful. I think we're talking about a $500 piece here, if I didn't ruin it. <laughs> um, and the only way I can probably say is uh, later today, um, I'll try that lemon and salt and see if I can um, get some of the blackness further gone. Anyway, thanks for your attention.